Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. We are almost at the finish line for the Worst Picture Project as we find ourselves in the year 2021. It was a year of slow recovery for Hollywood and the world, which had just been ravaged by COVID-19. And sadly, COVID is still very much a thing. It's the main reason why this episode took so long to come out. But I'm better now. Anyway, let's talk about the state of Hollywood in the year 2021. After theaters were shut for most of 2020, Hollywood had to make several changes, opting to either delay several movies or release them directly to streaming platforms or VOD. They started to return to some sense of normalcy the following year as theaters slowly opened back up, but several studios still opted to release their work to streaming or VOD instead of, or sometimes concurrently with, theatrical releases. In fact, that's true for every Worst Picture nominee this year. We also got to see some things from the comfort of our own home that we might not have otherwise been able to see. A filmed version of the stage musical Hamilton, for example, was released on Disney Plus in 2020, which was great for several reasons. One, Hamilton is awesome. Two, it allowed people to see the show while theaters were still shut down. Three, it's safer and more convenient than going out. And four, it made the musical much more accessible to a wider audience that might otherwise have never seen it as Broadway tickets are expensive as shit. I wish more musicals would follow this example. Or at least that's what I thought until the following year when Netflix graced us with Diana. Based on the life of the late Princess of Wales, Diana was created by Joe DiPietro and David Bryan. They've collaborated in musical theater before and won a Tony for the musical Memphis, and they put together a crew consisting of several other Tony Award winners. This all sounds promising, but nobody bats a thousand. Diana premiered at the La Jolla Playhouse in San Diego in 2019 to mostly negative reviews, but they continued workshopping the musical throughout the year, and Diana began previews on Broadway in March of 2020. They planned to open officially on the 31st, but that didn't happen for obvious reasons. Rather than sit on the play until the world returned to normal, or at least a new normal, they followed Hamilton's lead by filming the production that summer with no audience and various safety protocols in place. The filmed version was released to Netflix in October 2021, and if they were hoping this would entice people to buy tickets when the show finally premiered on Broadway the next month, well, that didn't happen. After the Netflix version was panned by damn near everyone, Diana opened at the Long Acre Theater on November 17th and closed on December 19th. Maybe those early negative reviews at La Jolla should have been a hint. Unlike a lot of things I've seen that are based on a true story, Diana appears to be a fairly accurate retelling of the princess life from her first meeting with Prince Charles until their rather messy divorce. And most of the events in the musical, even the more sensational ones, did actually happen. One of the early musical numbers has Charles singing, Whatever Love Means Anyway, which is similar to something he said during their engagement interview. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Jesus, how was that not a red flag? How was their age gap not a red flag? She was 19, he was 32. Anyway, the musical covers Diana's bulimia and postpartum depression and suicide attempts, depressingly all true. She refers to Charles' mistress and later second wife, Camilla, as the Rottweiler, which is reportedly what Diana actually called her. She really did surprise her husband at the Royal Ballet Christmas Gala with a live dance performance, although in real life it was set to Billy Joel's Uptown Girl, which I assume the musical couldn't get the rights to. And Charles really was upset by the performance, though there is some speculation as to why. The musical suggests he was upset by Diana's breach of royal etiquette, which may be true, but the two of them did a bit together at the previous year's gala, so it's possible he was just mad that he was left out. Furthermore, Diana really did record a series of audio tapes about her unhappy marriage, which were turned into a tell-all book by journalist Andrew Morton, and both he and Diana denied her direct involvement with the book until after her death. And she really did visit a clinic for AIDS patients and was willing to... <gasps> touch them without gloves, which seems silly now. We all know you can't get HIV just by touching someone, but at the time, that was a big fucking deal. The stigma surrounding AIDS was very real and people were afraid to even go near someone with HIV. Diana's work did a lot to change people's minds. We did not deserve that woman. Charles certainly didn't. The one thing I find questionable is the suggestion that Camilla was actively helping Charles to court Diana while they were having their own affair, going so far as to pick out gifts for Charles to give to Lady Di. As far as I can tell, there is no evidence to support this, and I can't imagine where they even got the idea. Why would they make this part of the story? It's bonkers. But then, the entire musical is bonkers. 
It starts off well enough with Gina Duvall as the titular princess singing a halfway decent song called Underestimated, but it almost immediately goes off the rails with the song This Is How Your People Dance. It portrays Diana attending a cello performance with Charles and wishing she was at a rock concert instead. The staging is bizarre, with the cellist behind Charles and Diana as they stare off into space. I know you don't want anyone with their back to the audience, but there had to be a better way. And the lyrics are laughably bad, throwing in several ham-fisted references to Freddie Mercury, Elton John, and other rock stars. It's sadly not the only time the song lyrics are unintentionally hilarious. The play eventually gets to the birth of Prince William, and then almost immediately afterward to Prince Harry, they're really trying to rush through this part of the story, and Diana hits us with this line. Oof. Throughout all of the workshopping, did no one really stop Brian and DiPietro and say, you know guys, that lyric is kinda dumb? Then we get the song The Main Event, which repeats the line, the thriller in Manila with Camilla. Boy, that reference does not work. I can just picture one of the songwriters walking up to the other and saying, hey, thriller in Manila rhymes with Camilla, is that anything? And no, it's not, but they went with it anyway. But by far the silliest musical number is The Dress, describing what Diana wore after Charles admitted to his affair with Camilla and came to be known as The Revenge Dress. But the play gives it a different name, The F.U. Dress. The original version uses the F-bomb and uses it often, but I guess Netflix wanted a PG-13, so with the exception of the very last line of the song, they substitute the lesser British F-bomb, making it the Feck You Dress. The feckity 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 feck you dress. No, really, that's how it goes. Just feckity 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 feck you dress. Yeah. Choices were made. And you would not believe just how many feckities are in this song. More than I care to count. By the time we get to the end of the song, they overdo it to the point that it just becomes ridiculous. Though I did enjoy the Queen's verse, sung by Judy Kay. Being a prim and proper royal, she can't bring herself to say the F-bomb, so she just kind of hums through it. A princess in a dress, a dress. It makes more sense in the Broadway version where they do actually say fuck, but honestly, the queen being unable to bring herself to even say feck in the Netflix version? I don't know, to me that just makes it funnier. But apart from the one chuckle I got from the Queen's verse, the song is pretty dumb and goes way over the top. Not only do we have countless feckities, but there's also stuff like this. And tells his gobsmacked subjects, he's had a lot of feck. The song has a lot of this. And that brings me to another problem with the music. They make several mentions of Diana's love for 80s rock stars, and it would have made sense to model the music after that style. And as David Bryan also happens to be the keyboardist for Bon Jovi, you'd think he would have gone that route. But all of the music sounds like it's at least two decades off. And that's not the only thing that doesn't fit the time period. Check out how the paparazzi are portrayed. Who the hell picked out these costumes? This is supposed to take place in the 1980s, but they look like they came out of the 20s. What year is it? They definitely went for a whole lot of camp in this thing. If that wasn't obvious from the paparazzi outfits and these silly songs, it's made especially clear by the brief appearance of Barbara Cartland, Diana's step-grandmother, also played by Judy Kay. This woman, who clearly loves the color pink, shows up to tell the story of Diana's own affair with James Hewitt, and this is how they chose to introduce him. What in the name of Vladimir Putin is this? And they follow it up with a lot of saucy dialogue that sounds straight out of a trashy romance novel. So I assumed your husband gives you riding lessons. He's tried, he's not very good. Perhaps he just doesn't have the proper horse. And do you have the proper horse? And just so we're clear, when I say horse, I am talking about your penis. Oh, all right, all right, I just made up those bits of dialogue, but aren't they delicious? You know... Yeah, they are, not gonna lie. Look, if they wanted to tell a campy story based on Diana's life, that would be fine. Based on what I've learned about her, she probably would have got a kick out of that. But they're trying to balance the camp with the more somber moments of her life, like her eating disorder, her suicide attempts, her work with AIDS patients, and oh yeah, her death. That's how the play ends. You can't end on a poignant moment like that when you've gone all in on the camp. They're trying to have it both ways and it just doesn't work. It feels like a bad roller coaster. It jerks you around all over the place, and by the time it's over, you feel like you want to hurl. 
As far as the cast is concerned, they did about as good a job as they could, all things considered. I'm not sure either Diana or Charles really looked the part. Roe Hartramp is a little too good looking to be the Prince of Wales, and Duvall is too short to pass for Lady Di. But their acting and singing are both on point, and they deserve much better than this. And Kay did a pretty good job in her dual role as the Queen and Barbara Cartland, although this line of dialogue kind of fell flat. In the old days, we would have simply chopped off your head and been done with it. Sometimes I miss the old days. Was that supposed to be a joke? Based on her delivery, I honestly can't tell. And the story feels a bit rushed at times. I know there's only so much of Diana's life story that you can tell in two hours, but it gets a bit jarring, especially at the end. They pretty much go straight from the divorce to the car accident that killed her, which is not at all how it went in real life. There's no mention of Hasnat Khan, the heart surgeon that Diana dated for like two years after she split from Charles, and even Dodi Faya doesn't get so much as a name drop, which blew my mind. How do you tell the story of Diana's death and not even at least acknowledge the man's existence? He died right next to her in the damn car! Overall, Diana the Musical is a mess. The cast did what they could, and there are a few moments of unintentional comedy, and even one or two of intentional comedy. But the songs are very hit and miss, and the tonal inconsistency gave me whiplash. In addition to Worst Picture Honors, Brian and DiPietro won Worst Screenplay, and Christopher Ashley won Worst Director. Well deserved. But they also gave Gina Duvall Worst Actress, and Judy Kay Worst Supporting Actress, which is just plain wrong. And three other actors earned nominations, which is also just plain wrong. None of the acting was bad, that wasn't the problem. Acting in something bad does not equal a bad performance, Razzies. When will you learn? And that wasn't the Razzies' only misstep that year. In one of their more tasteless moments, they announced a special award for Worst Performance by Bruce Willis in a 2021 movie. Four days after the award ceremony, Willis announced his retirement from acting after being diagnosed with aphasia. Initially, the Razzies doubled down on their bullshit, playing the It's Just a Joke card, which seems to be their M.O. They did the same thing with Ryan Kira Armstrong's nomination the following year. But eventually, they did rescind the award because they realized kicking a man while he's down is not a good look. At least they figured that out eventually. Well, we know the Razzies screwed up with Bruce Willis, but now we must ask the question we always ask at this time. Did they screw up with the Worst Picture Award? Is Diana the Musical really the worst movie of 2021? And I can't believe I have to say this twice in a row, but I'm going to say no because I don't think Diana qualifies as a movie. This is not a stage musical that was adapted into a movie like West Side Story, Les Mis, or ugh, Cats. Literally all they did for Diana was film the stage musical. Does that really count? I would argue it does not. I don't even think it was the worst nominee for Worst Picture. It's not the best, either. That honor goes to The Woman in the Window, which wasn't great, but I didn't think it was bad enough to be nominated. I can't argue with the other nominees at least being on the list. Space Jam Legacy, a half-assed sequel that was little more than an excuse for WB to say, Hey, look at all this IP we own! Infinite, an incoherent sci-fi movie that was trying to be the next Inception but fell far short. And Karen a movie about a racist white lady with all the subtlety of a nuclear warhead. And as is often the case, there were movies the Razzies overlooked. Instead of Woman in the Window, they easily could have nominated Thunder Force, a lackluster superhero comedy with an interesting premise, a world where the only people with superpowers are sociopaths, but it's terribly unfunny and a chore to sit through. Judging by Octavia Spencer's uninspired performance, I'm guessing she felt the same. Music was also one of the worst of 2021, but the Razzies screwed the pooch by nominating that the previous year for reasons I still do not understand. As far as my personal worst picture of 2021, I'm kinda torn between music and Karen. The former featured a cringe-worthy depiction of autism that everyone involved should be ashamed of, and the latter took its story of a racist white lady so far over the top that it might have made a pretty good parody except for the fact that the filmmakers were dead serious. Both are terrible and should not be seen by anyone. And I do not understand how Taryn Manning, who played the titular Karen, did not win Worst Actress over Gina Duvall. And I can't believe they nominated Karen for Worst Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel, calling it an inadvertent remake of Cruella. You're not funny! As for Diana the Musical, I find its mere existence fascinating. In any other year, this likely would have been a blip on the radar, a short-lived Broadway musical that very few people saw and was never talked about again. 
Happens all the time, I'm sure. But thanks to lockdown prompting them to film the musical for Netflix, it shall live in infamy. If you have Netflix and you're in the right frame of mind, it might be worth a watch. It's stupid, but sometimes hilariously so. And if you want to see an actual movie about Diana, check out Spencer, which was released about a month after Diana and stars Kristen Stewart as the Princess of Wales. If nothing else, it's further proof that she can indeed act. Twilight just wouldn't let her. Well, this is it, folks. Only one more Worst Picture winner to go. For now, anyway. And it also comes to us courtesy of Netflix. Ain't they on a roll? Until next time, I am the Smeghead, and Diana deserves better. Your Royal Highness, I think you'd adore my horse.